We're here with Mort Klein, the president of the Zionist Organization of America. And we're here at the Republican Jewish Coalition, and many of the participants and the speakers had hoped that there would be a red wave here in the United States. Uh, it didn't really materialize, but in Israel, just a week before, we in fact did have a red wave. Um, I think that a lot of American Jews have a hard time understanding uh, what's taking place in Israel today and, and how Israel was able to put together a, a strong right-wing coalition. Tell me what you think the role is of uh, Jewish communal leadership in America to explain Israel and what's happening there politically to the American people. American Jewish leaders, Israeli leaders, the Jewish media both in Israel and America have failed miserably in explaining the truth, the Orwellian truth, uh, no, the truth of the Arab Islamic war against Israel and the West. Uh, uh, we don't tell the truth about Jerusalem. Here we negotiate the possibility of giving parts of Jerusalem away when Jerusalem is not holy to Muslims. It's never mentioned the word Jerusalem in their Koran. If it's so holy to them, how is it not in their holiest book? Uh, no Arab leader ever visited Jerusalem when they controlled it except uh, several Jordanian leaders. Uh, there's never been a country uh, outside of uh, a Jewish state uh, that had Jerusalem as its uh, capital. And since the first census in the mid-1800s, the majority of people living in Jerusalem have been Jews. A tiny proportion have been Muslims. We should be telling this truth to make it clear that Jerusalem's off the table. Don't even bring it up. It's not holy to you. Mecca and Medina are your holy cities, not Jerusalem. <laughs> we don't tell the truth about Mahmoud Abbas. Wherever I speak, they're shocked when I tell the truth about Abbas. Netanyahu, Jewish, uh, America, uh, Israeli leaders and Jewish leaders should be making it clear. Abbas is a Holocaust denier. Abbas pays Arabs lifetime pensions to murder Jews. And the more Jews you murder, the higher the pension. And the pension is five times the average salary of a Palestinian Arab. And they glorify uh, uh, Jew killers, uh, naming schools, streets, sports teams, children's camps after Jew killers. Israel should be demanding they rescind every one of these names of Jew killers from these organizations. So should Jewish leaders. And uh, it should be made clear that Mahmoud Abbas is not a moderate peace seeker. He's a monstrous terrorist killer. That's what he is. He has no interest in, in any sort of resolution. Uh, he just wants Israel gone. He's been offered a state four times in the last 20 years, turned it down every time. When I asked Ehud Almer, why did he turn down those extraordinary offers, he said, he wants to delete from the clause, from the deal. I accept this was a Jewish state. I'll never do that, he said. Uh, I want to be able to bring as many refugees as I, so-called refugees I wanted to Israel. <laughs> that was uh, one of the clauses. And, uh, and he said, I want to get rid of the clause, no further claims. Can you imagine? He said, I won't sign a deal that says no further claims, even though that's the purpose of the deal. <laughs> so we should be making it clear that Israel's dealing with a monster terrorist in a Palestinian state. Of course, they've been offered a state eight times in the last 80 years, four times in the last uh, 20 years. They reject it without a counteroffer because they won't accept the state if it means accepting Israel as a Jewish state. They won't do it. <laughs> we have to ma make that clear and make it clear that a state would be a, ha a, Fatah, a Hamas Iran state. It'll be a monstrous terrorist state on Israel's longest border. We don't say these things. We should be rejecting a Palestinian state out of hand. And it's very interesting. When I debated Eric Yafi on this, just the former head of the reform movement, about a state, he, he says, I support a state. I said, you support a state in the next year or two? He said, no, it might be 100 years. So even if someone like Yafi acknowledges, I don't support a state for maybe 100 years. Well, that means he's against it. He understands that th this will be a terrorist state. We don't make these issues clear. And I, I, I really criticize the Israeli and the Jewish leadership for not making that clear. And when I speak to Jewish leaders about why don't you do this, you know what they say to me? <laughs> well, if I say that, they'll accuse me of being against peace. They're afraid, they're afraid. All right, what are they afraid of? It sounds like you're making a strong case, and uh, but still many uh, American Jewish leaders and certainly uh, many American politicians, including most Democrats, think that uh, Israel's policy towards the Middle East should be to divide the Jewish state for the formal creation of a Palestinian state. Why is that? Because politicians, <laughs> their job is to have solutions. Right? I'm a politician, there's problems, there's issues, I'm going to solve them. And, they, and, and since this problem is really not easily solvable, to say the solution is a Palestinian state is an easy way to say, see, I'm reasonable, I'm a peacemaker, I just want a state, even though they know that a Palestinian state 
would simply be another terrorist state in the Middle East. <laughs> but they want to promote uh, uh, some sort of solution, uh, which in fact doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist because the goal of the Palestinian Authority is not a Palestinian state. It's Israel's destruction. This is not about land. It's about Israel's very existence. This is more of a religious war than it is about land. And that's what politicians in Israel and America have to understand and make clear, and they have not done that. It seems like a lot of American Jewish leaders now, and certainly members of the Biden administration also, are, are highly concerned about the makeup of uh, Prime Minister elect Benjamin Netanyahu's next candidate uh, cabinet. In particular, um, Israeli firebrand uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, um, who is likely to be appointed public security minister, potentially uh, Batsal Smotrich, who may either become finance minister or possibly even defense minister in the next government. Uh, why do, why do American Jews and also um, American Democrats think that they can tell Israel uh, who should be in Netanyahu's cabinet? It is such hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, Biden Democrats in this last election in America were screaming that democracy is on the ballot. Democracy. We have to respect who the people select, claiming those the election deniers are against democracy. But we, Democrats, we respect democracy. Whoever the people select, we accept that. And yet... In the very next breath, they say, even though Israelis voted overwhelmingly to elect the religious Zionist party, Biden says, I don't want them to have any important post. This is horrible. He doesn't accept democracy, does he? It was a lie. He accepts the Biden and the Democrats accept democracy if they elect the people they want. If they don't, they reject democracy. And also, they demonized uh, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, misrepresented their positions. I mean, their positions, and I reject calling him a firebrand. He's a strong speaker, takes stro strong about his commitment to positions. He says Jews and Muslims should both have equal rights to pray in the Temple Mount, our holiest site. Any Jew wants to pray there. Why can a Muslim pray there and a Jew can't? It's outrageous. <laughs> he says any <laughs> Arab committed of, uh, convicted of murdering a Jew there should be the death penalty. We have that in America. What's wrong with that? He says any Arab convicted of terrorism after he serves his sentence should be deported from Israel. And remember, Israel is not America. Israel has experienced 75 years of rejection, terrorism uh, uh, of, of the worst sort. And finally, the Israelis have said, we can't take this anymore. We have to be tougher with these Arabs because they want to kill us and harm us uh, physically. Uh, so uh, that is the reason I think that Smotrich and Ben Gavir did so well in this election, as Israelis say, we've had 75 years enough, let's be tough on these people. We don't want to have to worry about walking down the street and an Arab stabbing us in the back with a knife. <laughs> so uh, I, don't ex I don't consider them in any way extreme. I consider them rational centrists who are simply telling the truth about what needs to be done to protect Israelis, what needs to be done to be fair to Jews as well as to Muslims. Why, why would American Jews call uh, the last government, which included Ram, you know, an organization that's Islamist, anti-Zionist by their own statements. Why would they call that a inclusive government and a diverse government? And yet, when you have a, a right-wing Israeli government, uh, they, they find it hard to deal with. It is remarkable. They condemn the religious Zionist party, Smotrich and Gavir, but they never condemned Ra'am. In fact, they embraced it. They were proud. It's, look. We have Muslims, in our government, and they're not just regular Muslims, they're anti-Israel Muslims, they're Muslim Brotherhood Muslims, and they said nothing, <laughs> because Jews are, are desperate to show the world, don't hate us, don't kill us. Look how we embrace even uh, enemy Muslims. These were enemy Muslims in our government. <laughs> it's fear of the world. And uh, uh, so they're afraid if anyone speaks too strongly against Muslims and Muslim t terrorism, they're afraid it'll make things even worse. Jewish leaders, in my experience, are frightened appeasers. That is, to me, the best characterization. They're frightened appeasers. They want to appease the enemy, thinking that'll make things better. And as uh, Dr. Kagan, uh, Fred Kagan, who wrote a book when he was a professor at Yale, uh, uh, on, uh, said that throughout history, appeasement has always failed. It always brought more violence. Appeasement doesn't work. And here, the left in, in America and in Israel want to appease the Arabs. It doesn't work. It makes it, it, makes it only worse. <laughs> and uh, I was really shocked that several members of Congress publicly condemned Israel. Uh, 
for considering giving an important post to someone from religious Zionists. And these were former friends, very good friends. They are good friends. Senator Menendez and Congressman Brad Sherman spoke out. And when I spoke to them, they said, if they have important posts to religious Zionists, it'll make it harder for us to, to defend Israel in Congress. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> And I, and I said, why didn't you speak out against Ram? They said, that doesn't hurt our ability to uh, support Israel. <laughs> but this does. Now you've been uh, trying to educate uh, American public and American Jewry and leaders on both sides of the political <laughs> spectrum about Israel for a long time as the head of the Zionist Organization of America. You know, what's been some of your learnings in terms of how easy or difficult it is to convince people of, of your positions? My background is in math and science. Uh, I worked as a biostatistician with the great two-time Nobel Prize winning chemist Linus Pauling. I taught high school and college math. Uh, and I thought privately, not publicly, not bragging, that I was a very persuasive guy. I knew how to marshal facts, convince people. I have learned after 29 years of being president of ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA.org, you'll learn more about us, <laughs> that the left wing, I can't persuade them. That, I've learned that they're not persuadable because they don't really deal with the facts, they deal with the emotion more about, you know, we have to be good to the Arabs, we have to sympathize with them, thinking that will bring support for Israel. It doesn't work. So I've learned that I, I've learned I can't convince people on the left in any significant way. And I've learned that the Jewish leaders and the rabbis in America do not tell the truth of the Arab Islamic war against Israel. They, the, one of the first things they should do is explain that there's no occupation. You know, the, the word Palestine is a Roman word. How can this be an Arab land that has a Roman word as its name? And the Arabs can't even pronounce the letter P. They can't even say Palestine. They say Palestine. They can't even say it. <laughs> and there's never been a country of Palestine. It was a region. And uh, this would be very important to make it clear there's no occupation. But when you, uh, but they're afraid to say so, <laughs> thinking if they start saying so, people will say they're against peace. <laughs> so uh, it's a great disappointment that even our own supporters in the Jewish world do not tell the truth of the Arab war against Israel. That has been the most devastating thing to me. Well, Israel's actually signed uh, four normalization agreements with Muslim majority countries uh, in, in the past couple of years. And would should that be able to turn the tide of convincing people that uh, Israel actually is able to make peace even without uh, conceding land to the Palestinian Authority? Well, certainly <laughs> it has proven John Kerry and others completely wrong, saying you'll never make a deal with any Arab country unless you resolve the Palestinian Arab war against Israel. By the way, notice I say Arab war against Israel. I don't say Arab is really conflict because it could be over tomorrow if they would simply accept Israel as a Jewish state. <laughs> So yes, I think this clearly showed that the Arabs are sick and tired themselves of the Palestinian Arab war against Israel. And they know this is not to their economic benefit not to have dealings with Israel. In addition, of course, the truth be told, they're worried about Iran. And they know Israel is the only hope to protect them from Iran getting nuclear weapons and Iran trying to take over other Arab countries as well as trying to destroy Israel. So yes, I think this has proven clearly that uh, we can make peace with other Arab countries despite the Palestinian Arab situation. And I think if President Trump had remained in power, you'd have peace with Saudi Arabia and a number of other Arab countries already. Biden has not taken advantage of this by pushing forward on that. All they want to push forward on is establishing a state, a Palestinian terror state, of opening up a PLO office in Jerusalem, Israel's undivided capital. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think, uh, 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 we've seen that uh, peace can be made with Arab countries, and I'm really disappointed that the Nobel Prize Committee did not see fit to give Donald Trump a Nobel Peace Prize for this extraordinary uh, uh, deals that he yeah, made. Yeah, you just uh, gave an award to uh, former President Donald Trump at the Zionist Organization of America dinner uh, just last week. Tell me, there's a, definitely a controversial move according to many American Jews. Why would uh, you offer him such an award? We gave him a rarely given award that we've only, uh, the Herzl Gold Medal, Gold Medallion, we've only given to Lord Balfour, Winston Churchill, Harry Truman, Golda Meir, Ben Gurion, and such, very few. He did more for Israel in, 
than any president ever did in the White House. Beyond belief what he did. Not only moving the embassy, recognizing the Golan Heights, cutting all aid to the Palestinians, ending the Iran deal, stronger sanctions on Iran, uh, leaving the United Nations Human Rights Commission, which all they do is focus on attacking Israel. If I were president of the United States, I couldn't do more for Israel than Donald Trump did. Uh, and yet because of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump not being careful of his words sometimes, uh, people uh, uh, criticize him bitterly. Uh, but I will tell you this, I called every one of my major donors and my board at ZOA, should we give Donald Trump this award? I didn't have a single person who said no. Everyone said yes. And my very biggest donors were enthusiastically saying he deserves it. All we did is say, thank you, Mr. President. We appreciate what you've done for Israel. We're the only major Jewish organization that publicly honored Donald Trump in thanking him expressing gratitude for the extraordinary things he did, not only for Israel, but for the Jewish people in America by uh, uh, signing executive orders to make it easier for us to fight uh, uh, for Jewish students uh, when they're discriminated against or when they're harassed on campuses. So this was to me an easy one to give him this award. And what's on your agenda for the coming year? We want to have a major focus uh, to have more people aware, as I mentioned already, the truth about Jerusalem, occupation, settlements, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and a Palestinian state. Uh, and we've already filed a number of lawsuits against universities and against even uh, 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 boards uh, uh, in various cities uh, who, uh, whose members have, uh, boards of education whose members have made anti-Semitic, anti-Israel statements. We've had numerous uh, Lawsuits. We're the first ones to expose Berkeley Law School, uh, where now 14 clubs say that they won't allow anyone to speak at their club if they simply say Israel has a right to exist. Not if they're fervent supporters of Israel. You know, they can condemn Israel, but say, but they have a right to exist. They don't want us there. And, it, and we've, we've written letters back and forth with Erwin Chemerinsky, the Jewish dean of Berkeley Law. And the most he could do is publicly say, their policy, these 14 clubs policy, is that it's very troubling to me. That's not enough. We are demanding that the clubs be removed as clubs that re receive funding from Berkeley, that they not be allowed to have space at Berkeley. They can still say what they want, but not as official clubs of Berkeley. And we, uh, by the way, we got uh, Brad Sherman, Congressman Brad Sherman, and possibly new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, put out public statements condemning what these clubs are saying and demanding they be removed uh, from the club system at Berkeley Law. So uh, we're, fight we're fighting anti-Semitism on campuses, anti-Semitism on the uh, boards of education. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we still uh, meet every single day with members of Congress or their staff to tell them the truth of what's going on. And I'm trying to convince other Jewish organizations to change their policies, stop supporting a state, will be a terrorist state. Stop making positive statements about Mahmoud Abbas, which they continue to do. Uh, so we have our work cut out for us. Uh, things have not gotten easier, it gotten much worse. Uh, because now, by the way, in Congress, we have over a dozen overt anti-Semites who were elected. <laughs> and we're, we actually have a meeting with someone from the White House to try and convince them to have President Biden stop praising Rashida Tlaib and other members of the anti-Semitic squad committee. He publicly praises these people. It's unbelievable. Uh, he should be condemning them. Uh, and uh, we met with Pelosi. She's no longer going to be speaker. She took pictures with members of the squad for a front page cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Where was the Jewish world not condemning Pelosi for this? She's giving credibility and legitimacy to anti-Semites in Congress. <laughs> So we're all over the hill fighting this, and we're trying to convince other Jewish organizations to join us, uh, which has not been easy. Ward Klein, president of the Zionist Organization of America, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me.